English friends. They even didn't know that we were deported to Russia. You didn't want to tell them because they, they wouldn't understand, or they would laugh. So you just closed yourself up. West didn't want to know because the priority was to win the war, regardless of the price. You cannot blame them for that. It would be fair for the Polish people who suffered so much to, to say, that what was done was very wrong. It's a history, it's important. One shouldn't hide uh, the truth. The Victory Parade in London. Britain celebrates the end of six years of horrific war. Polish soldiers who fought alongside their British and American allies are not invited to take part in the parade. Victory Parade, I didn't, uh, Victory Parade, we didn't treat it as a Victory Parade. Uh, of course, we, we, I don't even think that we are so much offended that Poles were not invited. We, uh, at that time I was in Scotland and, and uh, it, it was not a victory for us. Churchill said in the House of Commons, the fate of Poland seems to be an unending tragedy and we, who went to war all ill-prepared on her behalf, watch with sorrow the strange outcome of our endeavours. The strange outcome of the war, as Churchill put it, was that Polish troops and their families had no homes to go back to. They had to build up their lives anew, scattered around the world, over 110,000 people making their home in Britain. However, the reasons for this displacement are known in the West only to a very few. Not many people know that just five years earlier, most of the recruits to the Polish army were emaciated, exhausted and bedraggled. Like General Rakowski, the future hero of the Battle for Monte Cassino. This is the story of their forgotten odyssey. September the 1st, 1939 is known as the day of Hitler's attack on Poland. The day that triggered off the Second World War. The date, September the 17th, 1939, is not so well remembered in the West. It was then that Poland suffered another blow. Soviet Russia, her other neighbor, attacked her unexpectedly from the East. This was a direct result of the secret protocol attached to the Ribbentrop-Molotov Pact, in which Germany and Russia divided Poland between themselves, to all intents and purposes, forever. Edmund Majewski was a 16-year-old cadet officer. 1939, it was a terrible year. First, the Germans invaded us in September, 1st of September from the West, and then on 17th September, barely two weeks later, Russian hordes came in from the East. The Russians were quite cunning. They were presenting themselves as friends of, of people. The invasion itself is mentioned in Western history books, but its consequences, until now, have been consigned by history to oblivion. Czesław Zichowicz was 14 when he was deported. For me, the war, it was two days of invasion of Russian tanks Day and night, they were coming through our village and our world just vanished. Having occupied half of the Polish territory, the Soviets sought systematically to eliminate the Polish nation. To crush possible resistance, they arrested all the Polish officers they could find, whether serving or in reserve. At one stroke, Stalin was destroying the flower of Polish intelligentsia, professors, scientists, doctors, and artists. Dorota Levina remembers the last moments with her father. One night in December, they, unexpected, they came to our flat and arrested my father. My father, ex-artillery officer in the reserve, was intending really to leave Poland and join the army in the West. He, everything was repair, repaired when he was suddenly arrested. In this night, there were 200 ex-officers arrested. They were sent to three detention camps. 
News from them arrived sporadically until April 1940. Then, a disturbing silence. The Soviets now turned to the officers' families and the rest of the middle classes, as well as shop owners and landowners. Soon even whole villages were arrested for refusing to accept Soviet citizenship. No one was spared. All were taken and given just half an hour to pack their possessions. Halina Zhivushko was 13. My sister had flu when they came to take us away. My mother was begging them to let her stay behind. She was worried about her. But the Russians didn't want to hear. Around 1.7 million inhabitants of eastern Poland, not only Poles but also Jews, Belarusians and Ukrainians, were deported to the depths of Russia, into the unknown. Their only crime, they were Polish citizens. Janina Jokiewicz, then 13, vividly remembers leaving Poland. It was only at the station that we saw the full extent of the tragedy of our people. There were several sets of goods trains. Voices, questions and shouts were coming from inside. After some time, the train started and there was a great outpouring of the hymn We will not abandon our land, coming from all the trains. Everyone was crying, everyone was singing. The conditions in the train were inhuman. And just normal cattle train on oh, 60 to 70 people were pushed into one uh, compartment. The, of course, there were no bad. In the middle of that wagon, there was cast iron stove, and that's all what there was. There was no toilet. There was one uh, opening, little uh, hole. Anna Moschinska was then a 21-year-old. In the first week, they didn't even open the wagon. At once, you lost all your sense of dignity. You became cattle, because all the physical needs had to be dealt with in front of other people. Only after a week, they threw us a bucket of some gruel. Ten-year-old Janina Kvyatkovska's journey started tragically. On the way, my grandmother died. They threw her out into a ditch, and the train went on. Several of people died because we were very cold. We were given very little food, some fish, and occasionally water. We had to melt the snow. Bizarrely, this macabre journey had its ironic moments. We were crossing the Volga River. At four in the morning, we see some glaring lights, the train stops, we ask what's happening, there are floodlights, illuminations, some kind of a fairy tale country. They unbolt the wagon and tell us, look, we are crossing the most beautiful bridge in the world. So they are carrying us to Siberia and still doing their publicity. We were traveling for a whole month from February the 10th until March the 8th. They unloaded us in the Irkutsk region and that's where our life as the Soviet citizens of the second category, as they called us, began. We had to work, but we had no privileges. We were put in barracks and sent off to work. Those who had been detained in the first waves of arrests in 1939 and early 1940 were put in prison. After months of interrogation, they were sentenced on trumped-up charges and sent to corrective labour camps. Edmund Majewski was sentenced to five years of forced labour. The definition of hell by Sartre is if you are locked up with people who you don't wish to be with. Well, that was a thousand times hell because you were locked up with 
1,000 people whom you don't wish to be with because they were mostly Russian criminals. They were, of course, uh, maybe 25% of good people, but they were mostly terrorized. Stanislav Shurakovsky, a teenage cadet officer, was taken to Darem Bar. From there we went to Uchta on foot, about 700 kilometers. We were cutting out the forest, making a road, preparing the place for railway line, which, by the way, was never built. We had to sleep wherever we could. All this under the guards. If you step out of line, to the right or to the left, we shoot without warning. At about five o'clock in the morning, it was still dark in the Siberian night. If you are prepared to go out, you went through the gate. The gate had a nice uh, writing in Cyrillic alphabet. Cherestrud Kaspovozhenyu, same as Germans did it, Arbeit macht frei. Uh, work makes you free. Well. <laughs> the Soviets sent Poland's civilian population to work at collective farms and in isolated settlements all over Siberia and northern Kazakhstan. They brought us to Suchocin. There was no station, it was in the middle of a steppe. They put down some planks of wood and told us to get out. It was early morning and several thousand people got off in the steppe. And I remember a Bolshevik saying, now get your things and run into your Poland. It was a barren steppe and we stood there, it was becoming hot and it was already the beginning of May. And there was a terrible silence, despite these crowds of people. Everyone was waiting for something, not knowing what. It was all very depressing. Stefan Weidenfeld's odyssey started when he was 16. After a week-long journey, we found ourselves in the forest, in the middle of nowhere, guarded by a single Soviet elderly policeman whose name was Borisov and who guarded us with a rifle hanging on a string from his shoulder. Uh, there was no way of escaping and we all had to work in the forest. We were sent there for re-education in physical work. And this was, of course, a lot of rubbish. They put us in the stables, several dozen families in addition to us. There was no water, we had to draw it from a hole in the step. When the cows were drinking, there was no water for us. When they stopped, then we could have some. We cooked over little bricks over the holes dug up in the step. The majority of the people started working in uh, gold mining pits, in the pit called Yuzhna. You used to work in water. They supplied you sort of the rubber um, overalls and gave you, regardless of your age or uh, sex, gave you a glass of very strong vodka before you went there, conditions were really, really uh, harsh. I was working one of those as a 14-year boy, uh, nearly 1,000 feet below the ground. So were the pregnant women, so were my mother. My mother died of meningitis. She was 32, and we were left alone for six long years. The two of us lived in a mud hut, and when it was raining, we were wet. When there was frost, we were freezing. When it snowed, sometimes we were completely buried, like in a grave. And then our neighbors, people of goodwill, would dig us out. There were times when for three to four days we had nothing to eat because there was nothing to eat. When spring came, we stole whatever we could. 
We collected animal bones in the steppe, but there were few animals because people ate most of them. I learned to sit by the holes of steppe rats, and when a rat was coming out, catch it by its tail, kill it and eat it. I find it difficult to believe that all this is true, but it is the truth, nothing but the truth. Sixteen-year-old Dorota Levina was imprisoned for refusing the advances of a Soviet guard. As I was being in prison, you know, we were taken from one cell to the other. We were taken to a very small cell. It was 49 of us, and the cell only should take about 10 people. We went on the hunger strike, and it did help. It did help in this way that half of us, they removed to the wo working cell. We were peeling potatoes for the whole prison. Half a year later, a two-day journey on foot to her trial resulted in severely frostbitten feet. Her life was saved by her mother. She realized that she had to do something and do quick because if she wouldn't get rid of the three toes we were showing already, sign of gangrene, next day it would be foot and we'll be never able to cope. I didn't have any feel of those three toes that she amputated using um, sort of uh, scissors. The nightmare started with the onset of winter when we were sent as a maintenance team on the ice road. The ice road was a special f way of transporting large amounts of timber from the working area in the forest to the riverside. It ran for 11 kilometers along a stream and our job was to water the ice rails of the ice road during the night to prepare it for work in the morning. Because by the time we got back to the settlement, we often found that the temperature dropped to minus 40 degrees. It was probably even colder during the night when we had to work. We soon discovered that one way of keeping warm in this terrible night frost was to splash ourselves with water and this almost immediately formed a kind of icy armor over our coats and shoes and trousers and this icy armor kept us reasonably warm. I used to call it my private igloo. Aniela Novak was deported at the age of 10. For two years we have no doctors it was a, people who did have a proper nutrition. And um, there was cold, so many, many people died in that camp. Probably half of the people died. Aniela's teenage brother died in a Russian hospital. Their mother went to recover his body. She could see many, many, many bodies, and she recognized my brother. And uh, she said that he was naked and his tears were just frozen on his body. She, she took the body and with my brother they, they travel all night and probably day to bring him home. And then my father has to dig the, oh the ocean, has to dig the tomb and, and grave in this very, very hard earth. And that's, that's where, where my brother is, my eldest brother. At the very beginning, on our arrival to Fasha, we were met with a saying, which means you will spend here the rest of your life. And this didn't sound very promising. There was another saying we heard quite often, and that was, which means you will get used to it, and if you will not, you will die the death of a dog. Exhaustion, starvation and disease were taking their toll amongst all Stalin slaves. But the Polish enslavement carried the added burden of having to live amongst peoples who were brought up to believe that Poland was their eternal enemy. The Poles were told that they were to stay in Russia forever.
They kept telling us that bourgeois Poland is finished, that peasants were oppressed, workers were oppressed, that it was the end of Poland as a state, that everything would be settled in the Soviet Union, where everyone was equal. Well, their usual slogans. Through our two years in Russia, we had formed a view that the population of the Soviet Union was clearly divided into the ruled and the rulers, and that the rulers led entirely different lives from the enormous, much greater part of the population who were the ruled and whose lives were miserable and difficult. And among them, we found very many normal, pleasant, compassionate people. The Russian people, although they treated us with suspicion and uh, they were afraid to associate with us, were by nature not cruel. Uh, some were actually quite good people. They would even share something uh, of which they had very little with us. How could one survive such an inhuman existence? It was a terrible, terrible ordeal to be in a camp. You had to work, you had to suffer the hunger, from morning till evening, you were wet from working in a powdery snow. There was no way of drying your clothes up. You felt worse than an animal. And yet, you had to believe that there might be, there must be somewhere a higher being, God, who will, if we believe in it, will protect. Maybe we'll get out of it somehow. Maybe I will get out of it. Because I noticed, from my experience, that those who lost believe in themselves were dying very rapidly, within days. Our beautiful childhood was replaced with a nightmare. When there is hunger and misery, you can't think, you simply turn into an animal. We were like two little wolves, two puppies thrown out to be drowned. On June 22, 1941, Hitler unexpectedly attacked the Soviet Union. Paradoxically, it was the moment which brought deliverance to thousands of Poles incarcerated all over the country. Following Churchill's advice, General Sikorsky, Prime Minister of the Polish government, now based in London, signed a treaty with the Soviets, as a result of which Stalin agreed to an amnesty, a pardon for the Poles who were allowed to form an army. It was to join the fight against Hitler, now the common enemy. Whatever the freedom means in Russia, it was still a wonderful day for me when I was made free. I was called to the small office and they handed me a ticket, a railway ticket, and a little note. Not to say that they were sorry, but <laughs> I was released. I remember it was so warm. We were going across the field and in a little valley there was still water, warm by the sun. I walked barefoot in this water and it was so wonderful. And it was only then that I understood that I was free. But the Soviet authorities did not want to free the amnestied Poles. They needed every pair of hands to work for an economy weakened by the war. So many had to escape. The only way out of Kfasha was the river, and we had to transport 400 people with their belongings. For that purpose, we had to build 20 to 22 rafts, each consisting of about 20 logs, which we had to carry on our backs from the forest to the riverside, and had to make the rafts without a single nail. The journey lasted seven days. It was sometimes snowing. We had to spend the nights on the riverside under a primitive roof made of freshly cut branches. Leaving behind their places of confinement was by no means the end of their misfortunes. 
Janina's tragedy struck on her way south to freedom. W pewnym momencie pociąg w nocy, późnym wieczorem zatrzymuje się. Suddenly, at night, the train stopped in the snowdrifts. And it turns out that, according to the train driver, the engine is broken and we have to wait all night. Around us is only snow. The temperature is minus 40 degrees. And in the distance, you could see the lights of a small village. The people were hungry and desperate. So they decided to go to that village to get some food. My mother was among them. When they were walking up to the wasting snow, the train suddenly started. There was great despair. The children cried. And I realized that this might be the last time I saw my mother. And that's what happened. I never saw her again. And I understood that I became the only person at the age of 13 who would take care of my brothers. Their odyssey went on relentlessly. Exhausted, bedraggled and lice-ridden, hundreds of thousands of those released from the camps and settlements were making their way from the remotest corners of Russia, determined to find their army. But the further south they came, the more they were struck by terrible epidemics, typhus, dysentery and malaria. Many thousands were buried by the roadside. Janina, on an open cart, was sent to a Soviet orphanage. After two days, when we arrived, my brothers had developed high fever. We were admitted to a hospital, but on condition that we would not be with other patients, but in a wing under reconstruction. They put in three beds, and there, in the dark, by candlelight only, I lay with my sick brothers, who had high fever and were unconscious. After three days, the younger one, Spishek, died. He was two and a half. I spent the whole night with him, knowing that he was no longer alive. Only in the morning they took him away. I never saw him again. I don't know where they buried him. There was a nearby hospital cemetery where they simply buried the bodies without coffins. And at night, animals, hungry dogs, often dug up the graves. Jurek lived a few days longer. He was delirious, kept calling mother, and he too, after six days at the hospital, died. I was told that on leaving the hospital, I was to bury him. With a friend, I went to a storeroom for blankets and sheets, where on the floor, on a stretcher, lay my brother. They gave us the stretcher, pointed to the cemetery, gave us the spades, and we went to bury my brother Jurek, who was then just eight years old. People were dying like flies. There was daily about 100 people buried. Uh, there was no normal burial. They just put them into some uh, sort of the hole, put uh, some soil on it, and then the next row of the people, our relatives that came to, to Siberia or the port of Siberia, there was 43. Only 23 survived. My uncles, my grandfather, my uh, grandmother all died in the, uh, in, over there. The main army reception center for recruits was Buzawuk. Those lucky enough to reach it alive started intensive training. 
General Władysław Anders, himself recently released from a two-year stay in Soviet prisons, was appointed commander-in-chief of the Polish army. These new soldiers had to be clothed, trained, and most immediately fed. Although the Soviet troop rations were inadequate, General Anders gave orders that they were to be shared amongst the masses of starving civilians. For women, children, and old people, finding their army became the only hope for survival. Then in 1942, General Anders persuaded Churchill to obtain Stalin's permission to let the Polish army leave the Soviet Union. Along with the troops, a number of soldiers' families were allowed out. Put us to the on the train which was going to Krasnovoz. After two years over there, you, you, couldn't be, you, you don't believe that, that the, you could be free. I knew that we are going to Persia, but will we go to Persia or will we land in Siberia? By August 1942, 118,000 troops and 44,000 civilians had left the Soviet Union in three large convoys, to freedom, to Persia. They crossed the Caspian Sea in overcrowded Soviet tankers. Standing room only for men, for army, for uh, civilian population, families, was cramped right to the <laughs> brim. People were sick, they had a diarrhea, there were no toilet facilities, no water to drink, no food to have, but everybody was happy. Going away with the Soviet Union disappearing on a, behind the Blue Sea. We were staying that night on the beach in Padlevi, and I remember extremely well that I deliberately stripped myself completely naked and like St. John I washed with the water just to get rid of all this miasma of Russia. That was a wonderful time. Those fortunate enough to escape the Soviet Union were received by the Persians with warmth and kindness. Immediate and practical help was provided by the soldiers of the British, Indian and American armies awaiting them on the Pahlavi beaches. You should see um, the faces of these British soldiers when they, they noticed all, because that was one of the first uh, ships which came there. And here the old woman in rags, my mother was 50 and she looks like 95. The Allies launched an intensive program to feed the starving masses but many paid a terrible price. Over 2,000 Poles were buried in Tehran itself, decimated not only by disease, but also by the fatal effects of normal food. Of course, people were eating and eating and eating because they, they were very uh, thin and all that, and then they, they become uh, ill. Many people were, were also so ill that they, they didn't survive. The British officer in uh, Iran that received us was, were uh, marvelous. They, they did everything. I mean, there were uh, ladies from Red Cross uh, and so on. And they done everything that was humanly possible uh, for us to recover. Far away from home, a new makeshift Poland was established by the recent deportees scattered all over the Middle East, Africa and India. Young men and women could not wait to fight the enemy. Each victory over the Nazis would bring their homecoming that much closer. The whole atmosphere was of great Polish patriotism. Uh, we copied Polish poems uh, of the time, which were all very patriotic. We all sang songs. Uh, there was one poem uh, which we repeated again and again, which uh, had a verse, Może nie wszyscy, ale dojdziemy, which uh, perhaps not all of us, but we will reach for it again. Children and young people were given a chance to resume their brutally interrupted education. Schools and orphanages were established throughout the Middle East. Remember, boys, that you are the future of the Polish nation. Warsaw, Wilno, Lwów, Krakow and Poznań are looking at you and waiting. But not everyone was lucky enough to enjoy the fruits of the amnesty. Thousands of Poles remained stranded in the Soviet Union. Some were simply not released from camps and settlements. 
many others were dealt further blows when freedom was only an arm's length away. They let out a few families amongst them me and my mother only in November. We were going by an open lorry through a terrible snowstorm to Pavodar, 225 kilometers. It was terribly cold, winter, blizzards. We reached Pavodar and learned that they were no longer taking people into the Polish army. And we were left with no means to live, completely broken. Following the Soviet amnesty, the Polish authorities carried out a census, which located only one-third of the estimated 1.7 million deportees. What was also strange and worrying was that not one of the 22,000 officers arrested in 1939 could be found. In April 1943, the advancing Germans announced the discovery of a mass grave in the Katyn forest near Smolensk. 5,000 bodies found in a ditch were missing officers, shot in the back of the head, their hands bound with wire, lying in layer beyond layer beneath the earth. The Soviets were outraged at Poland's request for an independent investigation by the International Red Cross. Accusing the Poles of aiding Goebbels' propaganda, Stalin broke off diplomatic relations with Poland. From now on, Poland's fate was in the hands of her British and American allies. But it was a delicate matter. The Soviets were now a new, badly needed ally of the West, and they could not be antagonized. Sir Owen O'Malley, the British ambassador to the Polish government, convinced Churchill and the Foreign Office that the responsibility for the Katyn massacre lay with the Soviets. And yet, despite the convincing evidence presented in his secret report, it was decided to bury the issue, for all intents and purposes, forever. Eden told the cabinet, I did my best to persuade the Poles to treat the Katyn issue as German propaganda against the Allied war effort. There can be no doubt at all that during the war uh, a number of people in the highest political circles in the United Kingdom were fully aware of the facts about Katyn and uh, the Soviet deportations and, and other horrors. Uh, and a decision was made deliberately to mislead the public about those things. I think it's very difficult for people uh, after 50 or 60 years to say, uh, not that I made a mistake, but that our government was covering up the essential facts of history. This is best illustrated by the fact that the Katyn massacre was brought on the agenda of the Nuremberg trial and then, on the orders of the Soviets, was withdrawn. And all of the West agreed to it without batting an eye. I think this is very significant. Soviet Russia absolutely dominated over the Western countries. In July 1943, the Prime Minister of Poland, General Sikorski, was killed in a plane crash in Gibraltar. The future for the Poles left in the Soviet Union looked grave. Richard Sapper was head of the body coordinating assistance for those left behind. Already in February 1943, the news was reaching me that the Soviet authorities were calling up Polish citizens and giving them Soviet passports. At night they were raiding places where Poles lived and forcing them. Sign that you want a passport and if not, they would arrest them. In November 1943, the Big Three met in Tehran. It was here that Churchill and Roosevelt gave in to Stalin's demand that eastern Poland, the territory acquired by an act of aggression in September 1939, would become officially recognized as Soviet. Churchill and Roosevelt, in effect, handed over the entire area to Stalin on the plate. This decision was reached without the knowledge or participation of the Polish government. The Atlantic Charter, which nobody ever refers to, happened in that battleship, which was after the declaration by Churchill and Roosevelt, later on signed not only by the Gold but also by Stalin himself, 
says so at the end of this war, there would be no transfers of territory, except with a freely given consent of the majority of the population. The Atlantic Charter was just forgotten. Now, nobody believed in it. There, you see, that will be the end. You see, everybody went over there because Lvov and Vilno, which were two most famous uh, towns, that was our uh, goal, you see, that we, we have to fight. Refusing to believe that they were no longer struggling for their own homes, Polish troops continued to fight alongside the Allies in France, Belgium, Holland and Italy. More than 47,000 Polish troops lost their lives on the battlefields of Western Europe. For those still stranded in the Soviet Union, the fight to survive continued. All the Poles in Pawłoda, hoping to live with the army of General Anders, were loaded onto barges and sent off to the collective farms from which they had come. You have to go back. It's harvest time. Crops need to be collected. So we went back to this place and there, until April the 30th, 1946, we slaved away. Meanwhile, the underground resistance against the Germans continued in occupied Poland. In August 1944, Warsaw erupted and there was a general uprising. To the indignation of the world, the Red Army remained immobile on the outskirts of the capital and watched passively at the bloodshed taking place. To Churchill's fury, Stalin refused permission for British and American planes to refuel in the Ukraine. Without ammunition and food, Warsaw was bound to fall. The struggle lasted 63 days. The Red Army entered the ruins of Warsaw, free to establish their own sponsored government. It was soon to become the official communist government of Poland. The complete collapse of Polish dreams came with the Declaration on Liberated Europe, signed at Yalta. Churchill, by now deeply worried, did his best to salvage whatever was possible for Poland. But it was too late. Roosevelt, never much interested in that faraway country, was close to death and did not support his efforts. Having ceded eastern Poland to Stalin at Tehran, the Allies now signed a document which promised a strong, independent and democratic Poland. This was a great tragedy for Poland uh, and, of course, it has never been righted. Accept the results of this conference as the beginnings of a permanent structure of peace. Churchill assured the House of Commons, I see many happy days ahead for Poland. He then professed his trust in the Soviet leaders. I feel that their word is their bond. I know of no government which stands to its obligations, even in its own despite, more solidly than the Russian Soviet government. I decline absolutely to embark here on a discussion about Russian good faith. 27 MPs were not convinced and voted against the resolution. These people were our allies. These uh, were the people for whom Great Britain declared war at the beginning of September 1939. It, well, it was obviously a betrayal because, I mean, from my point of view, I was involved in it as a betrayal because I had fought in the army in pursuit, pursuance of a treaty which said that I, we would not lay down our arms until Poland was restored. And we didn't do that. We, in fact, very much didn't have it restored. It, we carved a large bit of it away. I think it would have been, we would have had a better picture in history if we'd said, OK, we are powerless, but we disapprove of this, and we'd refuse to sign that treaty. Yes. We didn't have gone to war, we just to say we do not accept this. Now, Yalta had been in many ways a great success. I mean, we had agreed on exactly how to occupy Germany, no problems. Uh, uh, we'd agreed on, although we couldn't say it at the time, bringing Ru Russia into the war against Japan, and on paper, good agreement on Poland and liberated Europe. I mean, on paper, if you look at them now, they're, they're perfect diplomatic documents. The soldiers just wanted to throw the arms out. You see, why should we fight when, when, when the, we, our territories have been sold out? But thanks to General Sulik, who was in charge then, and uh, he just uh, was going from one regiment to another regiment, and uh, General Anderson that quieted down. And uh, well, we, the explanation was quite true. If we do that, therefore, you see, we'll be accused 
that we are pro-Germans. But I asked the Pole what he would have wanted us to do effectively. Did he, would he have wanted us to go to war with, with Russia? And if so, how? I mean, were we to drop the atom bomb? But then how could that have been done with the public opinion in America and, 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 and Britain, which was full of gratitude and, and admiration for the Russian war effort? After we uh, arrived to England, uh, all the troops have been warned not to speak to the, uh, say, English people, or uh, what we pass through Russia, what it means to be in Siberia, what they have done to Poles uh, who were there, uh, because that, that was against the well, policy of Eng English uh, authorities. Unfortunately, that was uh, really amused us, because, you see, we know we went through the hell and we knew that, you see, uh, English people have been cheated. Zofia Mawaszek worked at the Polish Army Census Office. Powiedziano nam, że jak będziemy czytać listy, w których będzie cokolwiek. We were told that when we read the letters which reflected in any way badly on Russia, we were either to cut or erase such passages. We did not want to do it, because all this was true. But after our censorship, the letters were also censored by the British. And if we didn't do it, they were very upset. They found it hard to believe. For instance, when we told them that they came and took you away from your homes, they would say, but why did you let them in? You shouldn't have let them in. The British government behaved very badly, very badly, because we were probably the most loyal ally in the war. We did our best, and then we were not permitted to join our parade. In a Britain suffering from post-war depression, Poles were encouraged to return home. That was very sad indeed, because uh, uh, Minister Bevin has uh, issued a special uh, well, leaflet to the Polish troops, in, Eng uh, in Polish even, uh, advising us to go back to Poland in order to help to build up our own country. Uh, but uh, very, uh, quite a few went back. Unfortunately, immediately they have been arrested. Some of them were uh, judged and, and killed or murdered anyway. But the uh, majority of the people who came from the East, like myself, uh, well, we just simply said, we are not going second time to the same regime. And we survived. The odyssey of the Polish wanderers continued. They scattered all over the world in search of a new home. Over 110,000 Poles settled in Britain. Some spent their lives pining away for the green pastures of their childhood. Most, though, have become part of the fabric of British society. But even now, over 60 years on, their tragic memories are not acknowledged, their pain still unresolved. Out of necessity, they have had to reconcile themselves with their unacknowledged past. They stood for the democracy. I see if that is democracy, <laughs> therefore, uh, it's, it's one of the wonders. When I returned to Poland, I could not believe how there could be bread lying on the table without anybody having to hide it. For quite a long time, I used to steal it, although my aunt told me to eat as much as I wanted. But I looked around, and when she was not looking, I would run and hide the bread in the bushes. Later, I never looked for it, for I was not hungry. No, we didn't get any compensation, any sorry notes or apologies. I'm happy, I'm alive, I value my life, and I'm here to tell the story.